to the late Amorite era, the giants of Babylon and the writing of the Talmud. Last week we looked at the various challenges that contributed to the end of the Torah community in Israel. Today we will learn a story of the Babylonian Torah leaders and their massive contribution to the canonization of the oral Torah, and that's the Talmud. Now while the community in Israel floundered, the community in Babylon flourished. They, of course, were blessed, as all communities that flourish are, uh, with great leaders and scholars. So we spoke about a few weeks ago, about Rav and Shmuel and the institutions that they headed in Sura and Neherdoi. And essentially for the next thousand years, roughly, there's going to be in Babylon two institutions. That's going to be uh, initially in Sura and Neherda. Eventually it's going to move from one place uh, to another place. Neherda will be destroyed because of the Parthian War. And in its place, they're going to found the yeshiva in Pumpadisa. It's going to move to place called Mechuza, Masa Machasya. But at all times, there's going to be two institutions, two masiftas, where the rabbis are assembled. And they're always led by the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the yeshiva, the head of the masifta. And, of course, that began with Rav and Shmuel. And their spiritual heirs are going to follow. Now, I want to make this note, and I've said this before, but it's really important to repeat. Each one of these names that I'm going to rattle off right now, we really could have a whole semester analyzing their personality, their Torah contributions, and their impact on the Jewish world. That's, that's for sure true. But in our context, I want to kind of look at a specific era in the history of the Amoraim. So therefore, I'm just going to try to bridge the uh, spiritual gap from Rav and Shmuel onto today's subject, and that's Abaya and Rava. So after Rav and Shmuel, we have Rav Nachman, and Rav Huna, and Rav Chista, and then we meet Rabba and Rabbi Yosef. Rabba is going to be the Rosh Hashiva in Pompadisa. When he dies, that's going to be passed on to Rabbi Yosef. And uh, after Rabbi Yosef dies, it's going to be given to Abaya, and Eventually, after he dies, it's going to be given to Rava. But this is the the era, the era of Abai and Rava, that I want to examine uh, today. Uh, so, Abaya and Rava, they emerge, they become the leaders of the people when there's two major uh, transitions, two shifts that are happening amongst the people. We spoke about last week. The Romans and the Christians and the Byzantines and Constantine, they start causing a lot of chaos in Israel at this time. And the sages make a decision uh, initially uh, in a small trickle, but eventually all of them joined to emigrate from Babylon, I'm sorry, from, to emigrate from, from Israel to Babylon, and thus there's a coalescence of all the great scholars in Babylon. So this is a very unique point in history for, hundred, for 150 years, but really uh, for even longer, there hasn't been an assemblage of all the great rabbis of the time <coughs> under, under the uh, mantle of one yeshiva. And now, uh, under the time, beginning with Abai and Rava, there's going to be all the scholars together are going to be in Bavil, in Babylon, in, in Pompidisa. That's number one. And as a result, they're going to begin the monumental project of codification and arrangement and eventually the finishing touches and the writing of the Talmud is going to uh, it's all start uh, really right here and right now. So there's a great story that really illustrates, um, that illustrates the development of the amassing of scholars in Babylon. After Rav Yosef died, so we had Rabbah and Rav Yosef. Uh, after Rav Yosef died, Rabbah's nephew, which is Abaya, becomes the Rosh Hashiva. But there's a two-year period when there is no head of the Yeshiva in Pompadisa. Because after Rav Yosef died, the community was inundated with a huge influx of sages from Israel, and they needed time to absorb them and to adjust to the new development that they postponed the process of, uh, of deciding who's going to be the next head of the yeshiva and consequently head of the community f until everyone got settled. And when they did get settled, they actually, for the first time, 
uh, they had a panel to decide who's going to be the next Rosh Hashiva. And from the Babylonian scholars, they had Abaya and Rava, the two subjects, primary subjects of tonight, tonight's talk. And from the Israeli, from Eretz Yisrael, the Israeli scholars, they took Rab Zeira uh, and, uh, and Rabba Bar Masna. And, and the reason why they did that is they wanted to make sure that the new Israeli rabbis would feel comfortable and feel like they have a say in the matter, and they were of the panel that amongst themselves were going to choose who's going to be the next replacement. And the Gemara tells, Abaya, Rava, Rabzeira, Rabba Bar Masna, they were studying together, and they had a need to appoint a head of yeshiva to succeed Rabbi Yosef and Pumbadi. So, and they made a challenge. How do you make a challenge to determine who's going to be the next leader? They said, whoever makes a Torah statement that cannot be refuted, they're going to be the leader. So all of them get up and start making teachings. And Rava's teaching gets refuted. Rav Zerich is teaching refuted. Rav Amasta's teaching he also gets refuted. And finally, Abaya says a teaching that is irrefutable. Even the great stylist of the time can find and poke no holes in his arguments. And they pronounce him... To, uh, you're the one now who's going to deliver the discourse, i.e. you're going to be the head of the community. And after uh, Abaya died, died relatively young, died at the, at the age of 60, uh, Rava, was, who was basically the same age as he was, he became a successor uh, as the head of the yeshiva and the community in Pompadisa. Now, I want to give a little background of these personalities before we talk about their massive contribution towards the codification of the Talmud. Abaya was orphaned at birth. His father died while he was in utero, and his mother died at birth, and therefore he was given to a foster mother to raise him. He had a foster mother, but also his uncle... <coughs> Abaya's uncle was the great rabbi. So I know these names are kind of swimming in your head, but Rabba and Rabbi Yosef were the teachers of Abaya and Rava, and Rabba also happened to be the uncle of Abaya. And therefore he grew up as with his foster mother and his uncle, who was take, take, took on the responsibility, essentially, of being his father as well. Now, the Gemara says some interesting stuff with regards to Abaya and his mother. Uh, the Talmud, when the Talmud is discussing, for example, the laws, uh, the very difficult to fulfill, draconian laws of honoring your parents, it points out that Abaya had it easy because he was orphaned. He had it easy. Uh, elsewhere, Abaya uh, frequently would invoke his uh, very wise stepmother, his, uh, his foster mother, he would say, Amrali Aim, my mother told me, as if we know he doesn't have, he didn't, never had a mother, never, never met his mother, but he had a loving um, woman who was entrusted to be a foster parent, and he had great affection and appreciation for her, and he would frequently quote her, and that became enshrined in the Talmud as well. But his uncle, like we said, who basically raised him, he was a budding scholar and eventually became the yeshiva of the yeshiva himself. And therefore, kind of from a very young age, it seems apparent that Abaya essentially grew up in the, uh, in the atmosphere of the institution of the yeshiva. The Talmud tells a great story about Abaya uh, as a precocious 10-year-old. And I, to my knowledge, there's no other teaching told uh, in, in the format of halacha and the Talmud uh, of anyone younger than Abaya as a 10-year-old. So what happened is that Ula, Ula, another name of a great rabbi in the Talmud, he was visiting from Israel to Babylon. And Rav Yehuda, who was the leader of, who was one of the rabbis in Babylon, he had a son, and he said to him, I want you to go visit Ula after Shabbos and see what precise words does he use when he says the Havdalah. So he sends on the mission, go take the fruit and go visit Ula and find out what, what's the exact wording that he uses when he says the Havdalah. But he didn't, he didn't want to go, whatever reason, he said, okay, Abaya, he was like the precocious young child, rambunctious kid that was always hanging around, he says, why don't you go to Ula? 
You go and you figure out what happens and you let me know what happened. So Abaye goes and he listens and uh, he says, Baruch Hamav Dil Ben Kodesh Lachol, which is the same words that we use when we say Adah Havdalah. So the son of Rabbi Yehuda goes to his father and says, oh, you sent me on the mission. You know, and his father says, okay, what, what, what does he say? He says, well, I didn't go. Well, who went? Abaye went. He says, okay, well, what did Abaye say? Abaye says that Ula said, Baruch Hamavdil Ben Kodesh Lachol. And his father tells him, Quote, your pride and your haughtiness have brought about that this ruling will not be repeated in your name, rather in the name of Abaya. Thus the Talmud tells us that Abaya, because of his excitement to figure out Torah, his obsession with the details, willing to go the extra mile to go hear Ula's Havdalah, and thus at the age of 10, if you do the math, he was only 10 years old at the time, uh, he already began what would be a long and fruitful career of, uh, of clarifying uh, Torah principles. Now, he was a student of his uncle, Rabbah, and of course of Rabbi Yosef. And the Talmud goes to describe his reverence for his teacher, that, uh, we know the halacha is, when your teacher arrives, you have to stand up. The Gemara says about Abaya, when Abaya would see the ear of the donkey of Rabbi Yosef means he could barely make out the air of the donkey would already stand up. He had such reverence for his teacher that he could just see like the hint, so to speak, of his teacher coming, he already would stand up. Now, Rabbi Yosef is a little bit of a tragic story because he was blind, and as a result of his illnesses, he forgot his Torah. <coughs> he forgot his Torah. And the Gemara tells that Abaya, his trusted student, would always remind him of what he, he had to reteach him the entire body of Rabbi Yosef's Torah. He would reteach it to him as well. Abaya, uh, in the manner of the great scholars of the time, did not accept a stipend, uh, and he would work the field at night, and he would study by day. And uh, even in modern times, we have examples of such dedication. People that had to work, but they had no other option, but they still put in basically two careers. Uh, at night, they would work, and by day, they would study. And when would they sleep? That's an unanswered question. Uh, he, so Mark describes that he would water his field at night. One time, one of his students saw the great rabbi watering his field at night. says, this is not the way it's not the way it's supposed to be. The great rabbi, he should study. So he tells that he, he says, you know what? I want you to uh, I want you to teach me a night. And then he sends someone else to go water the fields. Uh, so it's, they think they're so clever. And we, we're going to take over the job for the rabbi. We're gonna, he doesn't want to accept any money. He wants to work for his own living. We're going to we're going to do the work behind his back. Abaya found out that. Uh, that it, his field was watered, and he said, I'm not enjoying any of the fruits of this field for the whole year. He doesn't want to have anything. He, he wants that everything that he makes, everything he consumes, should be his own handiwork. So for the entire year, none of the fruits of the field that was yielded that year did he uh, touch. He was a loving teacher as well. The Gemara tells that whenever one of his students would finish a masechta, would make a completion, he would make a lavish fest festivities to celebrate uh, the accomplishment of his students, avidna yoma tavel or abonon. Anytime anyone makes uh, a completion of the of a certain book of Talmud, I'm going to make a huge party. Today we like to make Super Bowl parties and birthday parties. In uh, the Jewish culture, it always was the greatest party someone could possibly make is when they finish a book of Talmud, and who knows, maybe even if they finish the entire Talmud. Abaya is mentioned more than 1,400 times in the Talmud, which is a staggering amount, but when you compare it to Rava, his friend, his colleague, and his successor, uh, Rava is the most mentioned name in the Talmud, and he's mentioned a staggering more than 2,000 times. You can't go two pages without reading, reading the, the word Rava, the name Rava, and uh, he, too, uh, is going to be the leader at this critical transition point in the development and the codification of the Talmud. He, too, like we said, is a student of Rabbi Yosef, uh, and he was somewhat of a man of extremes in the good way. Uh, for example, the Talmud tells that even though his teacher, Rabbi Yosef, was blind, 
he would always walk, he would never turn his back to his teacher. So if he was departing from his teacher, he would always walk backwards. And uh, the Gemara says that he would never, he would never, he would always look straight ahead and never turn around to see where the the wall is. So eventually he would walk back and he would bang his feet into the wall, and he started he would start bleeding. And uh, Rabbi Yosef is sitting there and he hears this commotion, bang! Some guy hit the wall, right? So he asked his people, "What's going on?" So they told him, "Well, this is Rabbi. He doesn't want to turn his face around from you." And therefore, he banged himself to the wall. Now he's all bloody on the floor. So Joseph heard that, and he gave the bracha, he gave the blessing, that your head shall rise above your peers. So it should be rise above the whole city. You should be the greatest scholar of your time. And indeed, he did become that. Now, he does not have the same humble beginnings as his friend and colleague and, um, and, uh, and pre- uh, pre- predecessor, Abaya. He was very wealthy from a family of great wealth. The Kumar describes that he had fields and vineyards and wine and he's had he owned ships. He lived on the Tigris River and therefore he was, he was an, an epicenter of commerce. The Gemara tells that he used to frequently bribe the officers to provide the tranquility for the for the for the scholars. But he had one obsession that towered above all else, and that is his love for Torah. The Gemara describes a story that there was a Sadducee who was watching Rava uh, with absolute astonishment. Because Rava got so caught up in Torah, he was oblivious of his surroundings. It's in a way, not unsimilar to the way he would walk away from his teacher. He wouldn't think about the fact that maybe there's a wall there. and He, he, he was transfixed. So there was once a time that he was studying Torah, and he didn't realize that he had put his hand... Uh, it's, it, in a location there was a little bit of a rusty nail sticking out. And he was like banging his head on the table, like studying Torah, and he's bleeding, he doesn't even notice it. And that's indeed, you know, we, we learn stories about people in contemporary times who had a connection to Torah that was so deep that they were able to zone everything else out. There are stories, multiple stories, of people who were not able, who had to undergo surgery, but refused to have the general anesthesia because they knew that that would hamper their ability to study afterwards. So they'd say, you know what? Just, I'm going to study Torah in my head. I'll be so consumed with the Torah subjects of my mind that you could do whatever you want. I won't even notice it. But certainly Rava was an example of that. There's many teachings that uh, his love of Torah and Torah study uh, become apparent from. For example, famous Gemara in Sota. The Gemara says that if someone studies Torah, Torah magna umatzla. You study Torah, it shields you from danger, and it saves you from danger. Uh, another example, the Rava would say, if someone needs Torah, if someone studies Torah, they do not need to have not the carbonos, not the burnt offerings, not the flower offerings, not the guilt offerings. All you need is to collect the Torah. You're saved from everything. We have a Yetzirah. The Yetzirah is determined, our determined foe that wants to make our life miserable. Uh, says, uh, says Rava, Barasi Yetzir Hara, Barasi Torah Tavlin. I created the Yetzir, Yetz, Yetzirah. I, God created the, the Yetzirah. And there's an antidote. What's this miraculous spiritual antibiotics that is able to stave off the incursions of the Yetzirah? That is Torah study. Rava also, uh, the list of Rava's teachings, we could go from here to tomorrow, and we'll finish them, but just a few of them, specifically, that highlight his love of Torah and his obsession with Torah. Uh, someone sees that they're inflicted with suffering, with Yisurim. So in Jewish philosophy, Yisurim, suffering, that's an example of God trying to send a person a message. So says Rava, what does someone do if someone is suffering Yisurim? So he should examine his behavior. See your behavior. See what you're doing wrong and see what lesson God is trying to, uh, to nudge you about. What if you search and you find nothing? Then you should realize that the real reason why you're suffering is because of bitul Torah, because you're neglecting Torah study. Any second that someone is alive and not studying Torah, in, Rava, in Rava's mind is a worthy reason for them to be smacked by God. Because how could you be alive and not be studying the Torah? What's wrong with you? And, and therefore you're suffering. Why am I suffering? You're not studying Torah. That's why God's trying to um, elbow you in your ribs until you listen to the messages. 
and uh, the stature of the Torah study in someone's uh, in someone's in Rava's mind uh, that resulted in him in him teaching the great the, the, the great lesson the great statement that someone who is Osek by Torah someone who's studying Torah is greater than a Kohen Gadol, a high priest. Why? The verse says, Yekarahim Pninim. Torah is more precious than Pninim, than pearls. And uh, Rava deduces that, not Pninim, but Lifnai Ulifnim, which means the inner chambers. Torah is more precious than the Kohen Gadol goes into the Holy of Holies. Now, Gemara even says that he once saw one of the rabbis praying very long. Why would someone pray very long? I have a lot of needs. I have a lot of needs. I want to pray God to tend to my needs. So he starts screaming at him, Why are you praying so long? You shouldn't pray so long. You should study Torah instead. Why are you abandoning a permanent world only to marry in favor of a transient world? Someone who prays really long, right, give me this, give me that. They're trying to improve the situation of this world. But by doing that, you're neglecting your place in Olam Abba, i.e., you're neglecting Torah study. But of course, Rav also taught us that Torah study is a means to become a better person. Uh, the Rav famously said, the objective of Torah study is tshuva umaisim, tachlis Torah tshuva umaisim, to repent, to come close to God, and to have good deeds. Kol Talmud Chacham she'ein tocho kebaro, ein o Talmud Chacham, says Rava. Whoever is a Torah scholar, but whose innards are not like their external, means the Torah has not penetrated their heart and changed them internally, they're not a real Torah scholar. Rava was very modest. In fact, there's a prayer that we say in Yom Kippur that was, it's taken from Rava's prayer. Uh, before I was created, I was nothing. Now I'm, well, now that I'm created, I'm nothing. I am dust in my life, certainly after death. I'm nothing but a vessel full of shame and embarrassment. That prayer, prayer of Rava, we say every Yom Kippur. Rava was a titan of Torah, and he would vociferously debate his position. There's literally thousands of debates in the Talmud. Uh, of Rava. But when Rava was wrong, the Gemara says he would announce to the public, he would give a clap on the beam, as they say, and he would announce, whatever I told you earlier, it was incorrect. And that's indeed a hallmark of a great Torah scholar, is that they, their own personal pride uh, does not hold a candle to the integrity of Torah itself. The integrity of Torah and the integrity of Torah scholar is that they're willing to admit when they're wrong, when they're wrong. So Abaya and Rava, they are presiding over an expanded assemblage of sages, and they begin the great undertaking, the codification of the Talmud. Now the conditions were ripe for this to happen. We see, we learn, the Gemara tells, when all the great scholars came from Israel, they were warmly welcomed, not only by their Jewish brethren, but even by the local Babylonian authorities. The, uh, the Gemara tells, that when Rav Ami came from Israel to Bavel, the mother of the king of the local area, she said, oh, I want to give charity. But who's going to disburse my charity? I'm going to give it to Rav Ami. He's worthy. He's someone who I could trust to do a good job. Their reputation and renown was so widespread that even the local non-Jewish aristocracy valued them and, and, and held them in high regard. Moreover, the, the Jewish political leadership, the Reish Galusa, they had a deference for the Torah scholars. The unquestioned leaders of the people were the sages and not the political leaders. Even though the political leaders, they were appointed by the government, but never once in the history of the Babylonia and Moriah era did the Reish Galusa, the head of the Exilarch, the head of the political recognized leader of the people interfere with the affairs of the Masifta or oppose any of the chief sages. So the conditions were really great for a monumental effort to be undertaken and that is the codification of the Talmud. Quickly, what's the Talmud? Talmud is 
in, in simple words. It's the explication of the Mishnah, it's the explaining everything, providing the sources, the source material for the Mishnah. It gives examples, it gives exceptions, it gives applications, what does apply, what does it not apply. And essentially, if you were to look at the entire body of the Talmud, you'd find everything you need to know to determine halacha. Halacha is practical Jewish law. What do I do? What do I not do? In every single conceivable situation. The Talmud contained everything that you need to know to achieve that end. Moreover, the Talmud also includes the Agadita. The Agadita is the philosophical and ethical teachings of, uh, of the Oral Torah, finalized and written in a codified, formalized text. Now, it's important to stress, this era, the era of the, of the Amoraim, they're the ones who worked on the development and the arranging and the codification and eventually the writing of the Talmud. But these teachings and these principles themselves go all the way back to Moses. Says the Talmud, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said, when the verse that we're going to read next week, Moshe goes up to Sinai. What does God tell him? I'll give you the tablets of stone and the Torah and the mitzvah that I wrote to instruct them. He's giving them more than just one thing. It's five different things. Says the Gemara, what does it mean? Luchos, the tablets, refers to the Ten Commandments. Torah refers to Scripture. Mitzvah refers to Mishnah. Asher Kasafti, that I wrote, refers to the books of the Nach, of the rest of the Tanakh. Leharosam, to instruct them, that refers to the Talmud, the Gemara. Melame, Shekulam, Nitnu, Lemoshe, Misinai. All these, i.e., these five themes, the Ten Commandments, Scripture, Tanakh, Mishnah, and Talmud, all of them come from Moshe at Sinai. It's important to stress, these are not newfound interpretations of Mishnah, where the rabbi said, okay, let's sit around them and have a, have a congress and a convention to figure out how do we possibly interpret the Mishnah. All that stemmed from Moshe. When Moshe gave the people Torah, he gave them everything, the laws, and of course the application of the laws, the Mishnah and the Talmud. Obviously Moshe, uh, he oversaw the total deliverance of Torah in a way that people could apply it. It's nonsen nonsensical to suggest that when Moshe gave the people the Torah, he allowed the whims of various people to interpret on their own. That's, of course, insane. And, and we find no evidence of any bifurcation in practice or behavior in Torah for a, th for a thousand years. And clearly the Jewish approach is that the Talmud is all, it comes all the way from Moshe. Now, it's the, the, no, so, so, so what do they contribute? If it all comes from Moshe, well, what do they contribute? So it's important to, to note there's, there's a few... There's, there's Talmudic principles, which is the application of the Mishnah, which is essentially the two halves of the Oral Torah and how do we understand the written Torah, number one. Uh, but there's also the Talmudic statements, which is the debates, the back and forth, the analysis, the drawing everything out, the, what's known in Aramaic as the Shakla Vataria, the give and take, the debate, the back and forth. Those formulations are contemporary to the Amoraim, to the sages that are overseeing the arranging of the Talmud. Now, in shorthand, the Talmud is called Havayos de Abaya Verava. The discussions of Abaya and Rava, because this time more than anyone, any other time in the hundred, in the in the centuries long era of the Amoraim. This is when the bulk of the work was done of actually assembling the Talmud into its eventual canonized form. That we learned uh, several weeks ago about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And when the Talmud lists Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai's accolades, it says he was an expert of Havayos to Abaya Verava. Of course, that's anachronistic. Abaya and Rava, they show up hundreds of years after Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai died. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai lived in the first century, and they live in the fourth century. So what does it mean? It means is that the Talmud that became known in shorthand as Abayin and Rav in our finalized version, he was an expert, even though, of course, he was a Tana. So during this entire era of the Amorayim, the process of development of the Talmud and clarification of writing began. And 
I want to go through a little bit of the timeline to try to understand this and, and kind of get the big picture here. Right after the Mishnah is written, right after Rabbi Judah the Prince finalizes and formalizes and seals the Mishnah, all the laws, the 63 books, the six orders, once that's done, the next process begins of arranging the Talmud, which is adding everything else, all the other details to the laws that are necessary to the fulfillment of the laws. That begins, of course, in Babylon and Israel simultaneously. And indeed, like we've spoken about in the past, there is an intercourse between those two communities. People go from here to there, from there to there. And in fact, there were even people who were de designated as couriers. Their job title was to be Torah scholars who would go back and forth and contribute to the uh, interplay between these two communities and their assembling of all this information and formalization of that. Now, we could essentially break down the Amoraim into three different categories. We have the early Amoraim, that their primary contribution towards the organization of the Talmud is to explain the sources and the reasons of the Mishnah. We have the Mishnah, which is the laws. Well, where does it come from? How do we trace that back to the written Torah? The, uh, what is the... Uh, Interplay between the two, like the, everything in the written Torah, the oral Torah have to over, they have to match. So you have a law in the written Torah. I'm sorry, you have a law in the oral Torah. Where's that source in the written Torah? You have a verse in the written Torah. Where's that source in the oral Torah? All that complex work, and of course to assemble the reasons. My time, my time, my time. The Gemara asks thousands of times, "What's the reason? What's the reason? What's the reason?" That was done by the early Amoraim, both in Israel and in Babylon under Abaya and Rava. Their job is going to be a primary job. Is it, of course, these people, all they did was study Torah. So they studied Torah incessantly. But specifically in what we have today, in the Talmud that we have from that era, their contribution is going to be in A, determining the correct authorship of each statement. So if you open a Talmud, you'll notice the Talmud is obsessed with attributing teachings to the correct person. So, for example, sometimes the Gemara says, Amar uh, Rabbi Rav, Vigod Amir, others say it wasn't Rav, it was Shmuel, and others say it wasn't this person, it was that person. Where did that come from? That came from, okay, we have such an abundance of Torah teachings, let's try to understand precisely who said what, and how does it all work together. All the questions and answers, the contradictions that are discussed in the Talmud, the give and take, the back and forth, the discussions are the discussions of Abaya and Rava, and that essentially is the bulk of, of the Talmud. And later on we get to what's known as the, the last generation, headlined by Rav Ashi and Ravina, we're going to get to the sealing of the Talmud. Uh, now, the next person we need to learn about is Rav Ashi. Rav Ashi, the Gemara tells us that since the days of Rabbi Judah the Prince until Rav Ashi, lo matzanu Torah v'gedula b'makam echad. We have not found Torah greatness, v'gedula and greatness, which means power and wealth, in one place. What this is doing, it's linking Rabbi Judah the Prince to Rav Ashi. Rav Ashi is going to be the one who, under his leadership, the Talmud is going to be sealed, and he is going to parallel Rabbi Judah the Prince, who, under his leadership, the Mishnah was sealed. And these unique characters were enabled by the fact that they had Torah greatness, they were the unquestioned Torah leaders of the people, they were also the Gedula, they also had the the uh, the wealth and the power uh, to support this monumental effort. This is going to take decades. Rav Ashi is going to be the leader of uh, the community for 60 years, going to be the unquestioned leader, during which time the sealing of the Talmud is going to take place. We've spoken about this last time, that the process of study of this time was that every year, they would every half a year, they would do another they would do another book of the Talmud. Uh, thus, during the times of Rav Ashi, they, we know that they did, over the course of the 60 years, they went through the entire Talmud twice. But aside from the regular, ongoing, intense study that was the way of life of the Jews of the time, in addition to that, they 
also undertook the effort of arranging the Talmud. This is a collaborative effort. This is the point I want to stress here. The Talmud is not what Rav Ashi wrote, a composition of, of one great rabbi. The Talmud is an effort that essentially takes hundreds of years and the collaboration of thousands of absolute geniuses and a heavy dose of divine providence to do. It's not like Ravashi wrote the Talmud because he had extra time in his hands. It was essentially the national effort of the people from the ceiling of the Mishnah until the ceiling of the Talmud to write the Talmud and to organize it in a way that's absolutely flawless. Ravashi and his people, they, they assured that the final text of the Talmud shall be absolutely scintillating, should be beautiful, should be polished. We know in the time since the Talmud was finalized, there has been probably billions of human hours that are dedicated towards understanding the, just the text of the Talmud, because it's written with such precision and so perfectly and succinctly that just reading and not even looking at the content necessarily, but looking at the content as it is expressed in the words, that is a tremendous, tremendous effort uh, that indeed became the study of Torah post that development. They organized everything in sections and the flow of the Talmud is it it's it's unbelievable like to look at the finished work and to even imagine that this is the product of humans because there's a narrative flow beginning from the beginning of the Talmud all the way uh, throughout each book and from beginning to end. The Talmud was sealed under the auspices of Rabbi uh, Rav Ashi and Ravina who followed after the sealing of the Talmud, it was memorized for several generations until finally it was written down by the next era of, of great leaders, the Savorite. They wrote down the Talmud and they also polished, uh, they continued the process of polishing. For example, if you look at the beginning of, uh, of various uh, sections of the Talmud, you'll uh, you'll notice that almost every section of the Talmud begins with an analysis of the words of the first Mishnah. And the idea behind that is that it's trying to show that every, every single word of the Mishnah is done with precision. Now what's surprising about that is that it doesn't, it doesn't do that for every successive Mishnah. It's only the first Mishnah of every book. And the reason is, is that they wanted to leave this message. Anytime you start, start a book of Talmud, there's a message they want to convey. Is that while the Talmud spends its time analyzing and explicating the Mishnah with a fine-tooth comb, it's important for you to realize that the precise words of the Mishnah are weighed very, very, very carefully and precisely. And therefore, the first Mishnah, they'll just spend a whole page and a half weighing those words just to show you how precise and perfect they are, and that will teach you the lesson that really all the words are, just that the content of the Talmud goes on uh, to other things. Now, in the context of Jewish history, I think it's, I think people may be asking the question, Rabbi, how much, you know, we're talking about Jewish history, why are we obsessing so much about the Talmud? I think it's important for us to realize the impact that it's had on Jewish history. Um, it, yes, it's a book. It's a collection of books. But it is the one thing that if we did not have, we wouldn't exist today. The fact that the Jewish community exists today is in large part due to the codification of the Talmud because it created a transferable entity. It created that you could take a suitcase while you're running away from persecution and that suitcase, you're isolated on an island and now you have the entirety of the Oral Torah with you. And the Talmud, is, a, is the, the books contain everything you need to know to live life as a Jew. Of course, you have to be a great scholar to actually find that. And that's going to create the problems for future generations. That they wrote a work of such astonishingly cla uh, ast ast astonishing clarity that it's all there. Just give me 500,000 human hours to clarify it all for myself. And the problem that resulted was that halacha was all there for the taking, but 
unless you were an advanced scholar who spent 18 hours a day with total immersion in the Talmud, uh, after 70 years, you'd get it. And you'd, you'd be in authority to, to actually reproduce the halacha from yourself. So what they essentially did was they created a transferable body of the oral Torah. Just like the oral Torah was done orally, teacher to student, generation to generation, and that enabled a dynamic, or and demanded, a dynamic, continuous engagement in Torah in order for halacha to be deduced, they were able to recreate that in a finalized and written form. They didn't just list the laws. It's not a book of listing of laws. It's a book of recreation of oral Torah in a written work. It's, it's, it's incredible. I, many of you have studied it, and that you, you can attest to what I'm saying is correct. Uh, pretty, pretty remarkable. I think there's another a good lesson, um, or at least a way to appreciate the magnitude of this work. Uh, in the realm of Agatha. Agatha is the philosophy. And it's really striking if you go from one section of Talmud, the Halacha section, and you dip your toe into the very next page, it starts talking about Agatha, the philosophical parts of Torah. It's almost as if you're in a different world. And this book was written by different people. And the reason is, is because in their foresight and wisdom, their goals with the writing of the halachic parts of the t- uh, portions of the Talmud were different than their goals of writing the Agatic portions of the Talmud. With regards to halacha, their goal was to make the halacha clear and revealed. With Agatha, their goal was to make the truth or the object of what they're saying unclear and concealed. Well, how do you write? How do you write? How do you write something and make it? How do you conceal once you write it? So what they do is they they used metaphors, and they used analogies, and they used parables, and the parables will contain hints, and each one of those words is really referring to other places in the Talmud. And unless means and they give you on each 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 agarata is a piece of a puzzle. You have one piece of the puzzle. You, don't, you can't at all tell what the picture is. If you know all of Talmud, and you can collect all the pieces of the puzzle, and you can rearrange them with your own capability, you see the beautiful picture that resulted. So it's amazing what they did. It's like, it's like a code. They managed to capture all of the deepest ideas of, of, of Torah in a way that it's written, but it's written that only the people that are the great scholars will understand, everyone else will see it and be totally befuddled, not understand at all what the message is. The Rambam writes that the role of the Talmud is also to act as an authoritative court for all Jews. We know the Torah tells us that the Sanhedrin, the body of scholars in Jerusalem, they have... uh, authority over the people. They say a law, the law becomes mandatory for all Jews. That's the verse in Deuteronomy. Additionally, we know that Halacha Israel tells us that if there is a rabbi of a community and they make a decree, that's binding for the whole community, but not for the neighboring community. But the Sanhedrin, they're binding for all of Israel. The Talmud that became the binding law of all of Israel. I want to read a quote here from, from the Rambam. All Israel are obliged to practice all that is in the Babylonian Talmud. And we compel every town and every province to follow the practices of the sages of the, of the Gemara, of the Talmud, and to maintain the decrees and to walk in their measures. Because all Israel agreed that all the matters of the Gemara, Gemara and Talmud is the same word, Talmud is in Hebrew, Gemara is in Aramaic. They're both the same word. All the matters of the Gemara and the sages that decreed them or taught them were all the sages of Israel or the majority of them and therefore their word becomes mandatory and obligatory for all of Israel. The sealing of the Babylonian Talmud is also the sealing of the Jerusalem Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud was unfinished and therefore it was finished in its finalized format in the Babylonian Talmud. Indeed, if you look all the way back to the times of 
Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai in the destruction of the first temple. They were faced with problems. They had internal discord. They had threats from without. They made an initial decision in Yavne to begin finalizing the halacha between Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel. And a hundred years later, or, and over the course of the next hundred years, they assembled all of the Mishnah. It was sealed. That process was ongoing, and thus the Talmud caps off what's a 400-year national project to write down the Oral Torah. And now, important to note, the application of it, the Halacha, that part was left oral, and that was where, you know, when you had the, bat, the briefcase with all the Torah with you, you still had a lot of work ahead of you to actually determine that. And the next frontier of the writing of the halacha is going to be uh, primarily uh, kicked off by the Rambam, where he's going to say, okay, we have a problem. We have it all there, but it's hidden. It's, it's, all, it's buried in the, uh, in the Yama Talmud, in the Sea of the Talmud. Only the great scholars know the halacha. And therefore, I'm going to try to organize the halacha, pull out the halacha, and just give you the conclusions and make life simple for you. The Talmud is a book of staggering complexity and intricacy. They, like we said, they maintained the oral format. And we have to be very thankful and appreciative of these great generations of scholars and sages who expended tremendous effort and ingenuity to finalize and codify and eventually seal and write down the Talmud and preserve the oral Torah given to us by God via Moshe and still accessible to us today. And I will take questions right now. I have plenty. Go ahead. As usual. In the Schottenstein uh, version, the Talmud... That we have over here on the shelf, there's yes. There's 72 volumes. I think it's 73, but go ahead. 73? Sorry for being nitpicky. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? Okay. How many actual books of the Talmud are there? Because that's one presentation of that. Yeah, uh, yes. So the books of the Talmud are all books on the Mishnah, right? So there's 63 books of Mishnah. Is what? They're all books of the Mishnah as well, but right. they're, they're elaborations of the Mishnah, right? Uh, the Mishnah, there's 63 books of Mishnah. Rav Ashi decided uh, against writing the Talmud on each individual book. There's, not, there's 63 books of Mishnah, but only 37 books of Talmud. And the reason for that is that the agricultural laws and laws of purity that were not applicable to the land of Babylon, they did not have their books on their own. Their laws were scattered throughout the other books. So you actually can get the laws of agricultural laws and the laws of purity from the rest of the books, but they don't have a dedicated book for themselves. When, um, when Rabbi has mentioned the 1400 times in the, in the Babylonian Talmud, yes. correct? Now that is in the, the body. If that's in the Mishnah and then the, the body, because then you have all the commentary around it. So yes. Is he mentioned also in the commentary? Abaya? You talking about Abaya? Rava? Well, the commentary is written on the Talmud. Rashi was the foremost commentary in the Talmud. He comes 600 years after Rava. Right? So he writes the commentary on Talmud and Mishnah, and that, of course, he invokes Rava when Rava is mentioned. Of course. Okay. okay, so it's the entirety. The main body and then all of the commentary. Including. Right, but the commentary came later. Okay. We'll, we'll get to the commentary uh, in a little bit. We're going to talk about Rashi soon. So what we're referring to is his name pre-commentary. Yeah, well, in the text of the Talmud, yes. Okay. Females. Because females are not obligated to study Torah, yeah. <clears throat> and for not studying, you, this is kind of like setting the stage for suffering and for other problems, I think. Or did I misunderstand this? What suffering? That I don't know, because that, that's what I heard. Women have a grade on, in, in the Jewish communities. I'm sorry? Are you talking about women? Women, women have a grade here. Women? Women have a good time. They're good. <laughs> they don't study Talmud, but they're... They get a pass on the actual study because they're, it's already there. Uh, no, that's not the reason why, but the Talmud was written specifically for men. 
um, with the exception maybe of the Agadic portions of the so of when the we say Jews, we mean... We mean the community, the, the nation. Good. Yes, of course. And women are obligated by all law as men are. But the Talmud is a book of, of study, of abstract study. And uh, it's, it was not designed... But nothing's more abstract than women, from my perspective, from start. <laughs> Excuse me? Uh, this, 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 has been, this has been litigated already. Uh, uh, the first words of the Rambam in the laws of... of Torah study is that Nashim Petur women are not obligated in Torah study. They're obligated in Torah application, but not Torah study. Rabbi, when, when people go to Yeshiva yes. and they study Torah, are mm -hmm. they basically studying the Talmud? Basically, that yes. Studying? Yes. Yes. So they all have commentary on what is written in, and they have art, not arguments, but discussions on. Oh, yeah. The, whatever is written in the Talmud. Yes, absolutely. And the Talmud and the Talmud's commentaries, because the Talmud's going to spawn tens of thousands of commentaries on the Talmud. Um, the most famous of them, of course, is Rashi. Mm -hmm. The Rashi's commentary on the Talmud. And he's 600 years after. He's 600 years afterwards. The That's right. Uh, the Rambam is not a commentary on the Talmud per se, but it's a book derived from the Talmud. Did, 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 did Gary, did I sufficiently answer your question about women? There's no... How can you answer a question about women? It's not negative. Don't take it so defensive. No, but what specifically was your question? Women are not obligated to study Torah. Yeah. I'm leaving it. Let's back away from this. This is something I'm Okay. <laughs> um, go ahead. So, does the Rambam, like, trump the Shukur Arut? Because they come before? You're getting ahead of us. Uh, <laughs> the short answer to your question is no. Okay. The long answer to your question is long. But no, the, the, the Shulchan Aruch, even though it came later, but it became more authoritative than the Rambam. Mm. So, uh, How that works is yeah, a very good question. I, I, I had a question. It's, it's I don't know. Um, Aren't we supposed to enjoy Earth's nature, and we're supposed to like you know visit all of you know what, what whatever we're supposed to do and all that? So how could we do that at the same time as studying Torah? There's a great picture of Rabbi um, Eliezer Yehuda Finkel, who was the Rosh Hashiva of the Mir Yeshiva, the biggest Yeshiva in the world, uh, and he was traveling. He went to Israel, and there's a great picture of him. I'll recreate it here for you. He's on the boat traveling to what was then called Palestine. He's got his feet up like this, and he's studying Talmud. <laughs> so you can do both. It's okay to do both. Okay. <laughs> uh, but nothing is more important than studying Talmud. Nothing. Yes, uh, you have to eat. You want to see the world. So you fly into Switzerland. You study Torah on the plane. You take a cab to the Alps. You study Torah on the cab. You get a room with a porch. You study Torah on the porch. And you can see them enjoy the world and, and, and enjoy this world, not the next world. Okay. There, um, there's a Jerusalem Talmud and a Babylonian Talmud. Right? Yes. So all the Mishnah written in Israel? Mishnah written in Israel, yes. Yes, Mishnah's written in Israel. That the Jerusalem Talmud was unfinished, also written in Israel. Babylonian Talmud is the finishing of the Jerusalem and the Babylonian Talmud written in Babylon. Yeah. So is the Mishnah... From the Babylonian Talmud, not from the Jerusalem Talmud. No, the Mishnah precedes both of them. But one is not finished. The Jerusalem Talmud is not finished. Well, it wasn't so, finished. Well, it was finished in the form of the Babylonian Talmud. So how can it be written the Mishnah of something that is not finished? No, the Mishnah is something else. There's the Mishnah and there's the Jerusalem Talmud. They're separate things. But the Mishnah is about the Babylonian Talmud. No. Opposite. No, the, the Mishnah the Talmud is the, the, the Mishnah. The confusion is... On the, on the Mishnah, was, let's go back to Moses at Mount Sinai, and he received five things, and one of those five things is... The Mishnah. There you go. Yeah, but he did, Judah the Prince codified it. it no, the Mishnah just means the laws. Okay, the Talmud, the Talmud is the accompaniment to the laws, which is everything else oh, with, uh, on okay. the laws. So Mishnah can be for the Talmud. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mishnah's yes. commentary on the Torah. Well, okay. and uh, sim that's down simple, down. Yeah. slightly yeah. imprecise, yeah, it's but... It's tough. It's, well, it's tough. It's not so tough. We, we could all figure this out.
Thank you. Okay, everyone, this was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, I am uh, looking forward to next week. Uh, we are done with the Talmud now and the great sages of the Talmud. Uh, what we do next week is yet undetermined. So if you have any suggestions, yeah, what we should do. I wanted to know the, Jew, yeah. the culture when the Jewish people went, went there. What was that culture like? But that's, first came, but that's a law. The, we're right now basically in the year 500. Give me something yeah. between the year 500 well, and now. Bill and Bill. Huh? The Bill and Bill. Ah, that's my. That's the 1800s, uh, 18th yeah, century, 1700s. Is there anything? I always been kind of curious. Rabbi Yosef Kuhn, the Jewish students, and then there was like the second temple from the base.